Hello, everyone. This is James Charles from the Sands Institute. I want to welcome you to our webcast today, uh, Reducing Federal Systems Risk with the 20 Critical Controls. Uh, we have an exciting presentation for you today. Uh, we've got three different speakers. We're going to have an opportunity to talk today a little bit more about how the 20 Critical Controls is being implemented and influencing uh, federal information security controls, uh, especially in the U.S. government. Uh, today we have with us G. Mark Hardy uh, from National Security Corporation. We have Michael Thielander from Tripwire. And Don Ferg is from Patriot Technologies, who are going to have an opportunity to speak today and give you a little bit more about this exciting topic. At the end of the presentation, we hope to leave a little bit of time for questions. So for those of you who do have questions about the material that's being presented today, uh, I would encourage you in the chat window of the Illuminate session, I'd encourage you to ask your questions to that window. You'll notice in the chat window that's there, uh, you can give uh, you can send your comments to the entire room. Uh, in this case, we ask just to send those requests and those comments to the moderators. Uh, we'll be more than happy to answer those near the end of the presentation. If we don't get your question right away, don't worry. We are going to save those questions for whatever time is available at the end of the presentation, and we'll just take as many questions as we can. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started, and I'll turn the presentation over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, James. Hey, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on where you're at. I'm glad to talk today about reducing federal systems risk with the 20 uh, critical controls. Now, we're talking about federal systems. Why do we care so much about federal systems? And the reality is, is that we've got to face it, that we are under attack. There's an unprecedented level of cyber threat that's out there. Uh, nation states, organized crime, uh, non-government organizations to include terrorist organizations, uh, even disgruntled individuals, uh, you know, hacker groups such as Anonymous and the like, are all potential adversaries against the United States. And the danger is, is that this is not a, an isolated incident or something that happens once or twice. This is a trend, and it's beginning to continue and get worse. Every day you can find in the press new compromises. There's finding situations where government websites have been hacked, uh, systems have been compromised, uh, information has been leaked. And a big problem here also is the hemorrhaging of intellectual property and capital from the United States. This is not just a problem for the U.S., but it's true for a number of nations as well. As, uh, and what we want to make sure is that we can take a leadership role here in the U.S. to define how do we go ahead and protect the things. Well, of course, the first issue there is for most people is that they'll find themselves on the front line of defense. Not too many people get the chance to go out and play offense, although lawfully they can do that in certain military organizations. But the reality is, is that defense is their top priority for our leadership within the federal environment. The Department of Homeland Security has upped their budget. Uh, last year, it was four, or this year, that's like, in 2012, their budget was $459 million for cybersecurity. Their budget submission for FY 2013, $769 million, a whole lot more. Uh, if we take a look at the DOD CIO, Terry Takai, she said that uh, on her own page, one quote, information is our greatest strategic asset. And as she puts out a 10-point plan for IT modernization that emphasizes leveraging automated tools and continual assessments to increase security. In addition, even at the uh, RSA conference, there's been talk about U.S. and government agencies adopting the SANS 20 critical controls as a security standard. Well, that sounds great, but you know, what's guiding these things? What's causing attackers to want to do things? Is it just random attacks, or does there tend to be some sort of uh, overriding theme? Uh, let me quote one of the great generals from over 2,000 years ago, Chinese General Sun Tzu, who had said speed is the essence of war. So take advantage of the enemy's unpreparedness, travel by unexpected routes, and strike him where he has taken no precautions. Now that to me sounds like a pretty good recipe for cyber attack. And so as a result, what we find is that a lot of the attacks go where we've taken no precautions. Think of things like zero days, unpatched systems that we have not prepared ourselves for. And in general, any time that we find ourselves that a situation where you have not taken the latest security defense measures, it's going to be a breach. It's no longer a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Well, there's probably a little bit of good news on the other side, and that says that if attackers have principles, then as defenders, we should have principles as well, and we do. A key element for a successful federal cyber defense strategy will be the SANS 20 critical security controls. Uh, we've done a number of webcasts on that. I'm going to presume that many people online are familiar or at least have heard about it. But let me explain a little bit about what we can do with this here. The SANS 20 critical security controls the consensus of government and non-government experts. Uh, that was put together over a period of time, uh, which 
had significant leadership uh, John Gilligan, who used to be the CIO for the Air Force and also went over to the Department of Energy, took the lead on that. And so what we have is a lot of uh, smart people putting their minds together, a lot of extensive research and collaboration. And so what this represents then is a set of best practices, but they're not just random. They don't just say, hey, let's just do this and do that and do that, and maybe we'll feel a little bit better and more secure. Uh, they focus on trying to go ahead and help direct us toward reaching a higher goal. And to a large extent, a lot of that higher goal is meeting the compliance for FISMA. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, but recognize that the 20 critical security controls is not legislation. This is not passed by Congress. It's not a federal standard. It's not a fixed publication. It's not a national security uh, or a NIST standard. What this is then is a prioritized approach. And this prioritized approach is going to allow those who follow it to a better job of complying with the Federal Information Security Management Act. Now, what's that? Well, FISMA was enacted about 10 years ago as public law. And what it does is it provided really for the first time a good agency-wide information security program requirement. Uh, if you don't have security, you don't get a budget. Uh, that got people's attention. And so what we found then is that with an established risk framework that federal agencies and the like were saying, hey, well, we've got to go get serious about this thing. And so what happened is FISMA started to push security out of the server room and more into the boardroom. They got executives saying, if I want to be able to be successful, if I want to accomplish my mission, I can't have my IT budget minimized or reduced because of the fact that I don't comply with security. So from that perspective, pretty good idea. Well, the downside, though, is that it's more of a tendency of a mindset of compliance. If I check all the boxes, I'm good. Well, a security practitioner will tell you after a number of years in the business that compliance does not equal security. There are fully compliant systems that get hacked every single day. And so all that does is it represents a minimum standard. As the joke goes, what do you call the person who graduates last in their medical school class? Doctor, right? Well, what do you not want to call that person? My doctor. Well, in the same way, compliance gives you a minimum passing grade. It is not representative of excellence. It doesn't mean that you've got every single danger guarded against. And so we have to do better. In addition, what you might find is that um, it's expensive. It's an analysis cost, and they figured out that by 2009, in trying to comply with this rule, that they estimated about $40 billion in compliance. Well, that's pretty expensive. And so as a result, they say, okay, fine, what's next? Well, by automating reporting, that helps quite a bit. Because instead of having to manually collect all these logs, put them together, paste them up together in a report, print them out, and mail them in, by the time they arrive, they're obsolete again, we can go ahead and do automated reporting. And so the White House directed agencies to submit monthly updates uh, back in November 2010. And uh, in this current fiscal year, the reporting requirements haven't changed. Well, the nice thing is that it's structured, it provides a framework, but it doesn't necessarily adjust to some of the new threats. So what's happened is Congress has said, hey, let's go ahead and pass some legislation. So HR, House of Representatives, uh, Bill 4900, the United States Information Communications Enhancement Act, or the U.S. ICE Act. That was considered to be a potential opportunity to go ahead and uh, recognize the fact that the Internet's interconnected and agency networks are all interconnected and all this stuff has to be protected as a whole. Well, I attracted two sponsors, and then, of course, it died as a lot of legislation does with a lack of interest. So roll the clock forward a little bit. Senate Bill 921, the Federal Information Security Amendments Act of 2010, or FISMA 2.0. What this was designed to do is to go ahead and again also recognize all this highly networked nature, but provide a mechanism for improved oversight. But this legislation died in committee. So in this current um, Congress, H.R. 1136, Executive Cyberspace Coordination Act, that's stuck in committee. It was gone into committee over a year ago. Now, perhaps one of the best opportunities to come out is a Federal Information Security Amendments Act of 2012. Sounds an awful lot like the Federal Information Security Amendments Act of 2010, doesn't it? Except this one's coming from the House. And it's introduced by uh, Representative of California. And the good news is, is that he's the chair of his own committee. Uh, that means that uh, probably we're going to find out this thing is going to get reported out of committee. But if you go to GovTrack, where they go ahead and they estimate the chance of success, last time I took a look, just a couple days ago, they were only estimating it had about a 9% chance of success. So what that means is that all Congress is talking about upgrading the law and doing things, we're going to have to look to other sources for leadership in the federal agencies. 
that's where the 20 critical controls come in. We find out that it wasn't developed in a vacuum, as I said. We've got incident response teams from the Department of Defense and non-defense agencies, uh, the computer emergency readiness teams of the search, FBI, law enforcement, DOE, forensic experts, all these folks contributed all this information to be able to go ahead and make this thing valuable and work for you. In addition, federal CIOs and CISOs were polled to be able to provide their inputs in terms of is this workable? Because it doesn't do you any good to develop a technical standard if nobody can do anything with it. And so with that as a foundation, they were able to then come up with a list of 20 controls that were deemed to be those things that if we do them, if we do them effectively, you get effective cyber defense. You can help meet the re compliance requirements of FISMA, but more to the point, you can do some real life risk reduction. So here's the first of 10 of the 20 critical controls. And you'll find out that there's a lot of ways to slice and dice this. You know, on the left hand side, you'll see numbers 1 through 10, but this doesn't necessarily mean that you implement them 1 through 10. Rather, what they are is they're prioritized based upon how NSA assess that they're able to affect the uh, attack mitigation. How well does this thing defend against attacks? And also, what's their tier? The first couple ones are foundational. You've got to do this. You've got to have an inventory of your devices. You've got to have an inventory of your software. If you don't have that, nothing else matters. And then beyond that, we find out is looking at other defenses and data recovery capability and the like, very, very important to be able to go ahead and proceed and ensure that an enterprise is effectively protected. If we look at the second half of the 20 critical controls, we can find out that you know, those priorities are going down a little bit. Their ability to go ahead and, and mitigate attacks is being reduced, but they're still important enough to be tested. So the last one, security uh, or penetration tests and red team exercises. Um, those are very important. That's an exercise of how well we do. The problem is that's the sexy stuff. If you're in the computer security world, that's the stuff you like doing. The problem with that, though, is that that's at the bottom of the list. That's what you do when you're in pretty good shape and you know what else you're looking at. Uh, if you say, okay, fine, well, what do I do first? Maybe I don't have a secure enterprise environment for security. I just inherited this job and they said, go figure it out. Well, you don't necessarily have to start at one. First thing you're going to do is do your own assessment. And we'll find out that, for example, if you look at the bottom half of the slide, if you have a newer immature program, NSA says, hey, three things you absolutely have to do right out of the box. Malware defenses. Make sure you're protecting yourself against applications or code that's going to go ahead and cause damage to your systems. Provide a data recovery capability. So if you do lose information, you can get it back. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't do you any good to have all these massive defenses that are 99.9% .9 effective, but if the point one gets through and wipes you down to nothing and you have no backup, uh, you've lost the game. And then control nine, looking at the skills assessment and training. This is really key because you can have well-meaning people who really want to do the right thing. But if they don't know what the right thing is, they're going to have to guess. And a lot of times people guess wrong. In the security world, guessing wrong seems to be almost a pastime because it's not necessarily intuitive how to go ahead and protect things. So the nice thing also about these critical controls is that they lend themselves to automation. The first 15 of the 20 controls are designed to be fully automated. It does not require a human in the loop to go ahead and survey and gather information, write up reports, deaths can all be rolled up. And that's hugely important because when we look at the size and the scope of federal systems, it's beyond the range of one person to be able to just go ahead and manage it. Now, NSA has also provided a view that allows us to kind of re-look at or kind of slice the critical controls in a different direction. And here's the uh, NSA view of the controls categorized by attack mitigation impact and importance. So if you look at an adversary's actions, which you do the reconnaissance, you get in, you stay in, and then you exploit. Different controls are going to work at different levels of that attack sequence. And therefore, by being able to stop attacks early and then stop multiple attacks, and for those that do get through by mitigating the impacts of attacks, we can find out that these control sets are then very, very powerful tools to allow us to go ahead and prioritize actions and assess where are we. Are we trying to attack early attacks? Let's focus on these reconnaissance items. Somebody's already in. Let's kick them out and focus on those that prevent them from staying in. So that gives us a good sense of what to be doing next. Now let's drill down a little bit into the critical control to see what it looks like. Because it's not just monolithic. Each control has a sub-controls. And these are grouped into different categories. Things like quick wins and improved visibility, a hardening of configuration, and uh, even advanced techniques. Well, OK, great. Well, what does that mean? Let's take an example of critical control number two. 
Now, critical control number two is the inventory of authorized and unauthorized software. All right, that's high up there. That's a foundational requirement. It's a very high impact on attack mitigation. A quick win, if you're starting out from scratch, would be enumerate the authorized software that's available on each system. If you don't know what's even running on the machine or what's supposed to run on the machine, how are you going to defend? Once that quick win is under your belt, pretty straightforward because there's, again, automated tools to do this. This is designed to be automated. We can improve the visibility. Now we take these inventory tools and we just pull them throughout the enterprise. Now I can roll up all this information. We can provide reports back to system administrators saying, here's what's working, or here's what's not working, or here's what you're responsible and you're not doing a good job of. Uh, we can then can prove it, do better configuration. Now we can deploy application whitelisting. This says these are the only apps that are allowed to run on the machine. Something new shows up, you've never seen it before, and sorry, it's not going to run. Someone has to request an exception report, and then you go ahead and have somebody approve that to make sure that the code is A, has a business purpose, it's valid, and B, it's not malicious. And ultimately, you get to the advanced level where you can do trusted snapshots. Now you can recover a virtual machine right away, and so if a machine is corrupted or destroyed and you're running into virtualization, just reload the image. Start back up on a safe, known location, and off you go. So this sounds like a really powerful tool set. Um, so the question is then, why does this work for federal systems? It works for federal systems for a number of reasons. It's had a tremendous amount of input from federal agencies. Therefore, this wasn't just invented out there in a vacuum or created in a, in a vendor basement someplace. It prioritizes cyber defense actions. It helps you know what to do first and what to do next, and then what level you can drill down and down to go ahead and make sure things happen in the right order. It's geared toward FISMA compliance, and that is key, because FISMA is a law, and you don't have a choice about that. And because FISMA now requires automated reporting, and these critical controls are highly automatable for the first 15, it's a perfect fit. And it scales. It scales really, really well. It can work across an entire agency. Here's an example. Let's look at the U.S. Department of State. John Stryker is a CIO. And what he did is he utilized the 20 controls, combined with automated awareness tools, and produced a phenomenal response rate was able to reduce the measured security risk 94% at the U.S. Department of State. Now, that's tremendous. The problem that he faced and that a lot of security leadership faces is you're given the responsibility for security. You want to hold system administrators accountable for security reduction, but they don't work for you. You don't have formal authority over them. And so there tends to be a mismatch here in terms of what you're trying to accomplish with what the leadership tools are that you've been given to accomplish. So let me digress real quickly to what I call Leadership 101. Uh, I was privileged to run leadership training for the Navy Reserve, about 70,000 reservists. And one of the key elements that we included in our leadership classes was responsibility, authority, and accountability. If someone is responsible for something, you're obligated to provide that. I'm responsible for getting this job done. Got it. I may or may not have the authority to get the job done. I may have to influence people. In the military, it's great. It's positional authority. You look at what's on your collar. If there's stars there, guess what? It gets done. Um, and, but accountability is you're liable for the action. Now, note that some of these things can be delegated and some of them cannot. I can go ahead to a, a subordinate and say, I give you the authority to act on my behalf to make this thing happen. And I'm going to hold you accountable for making that happen, but at the end of the day, it's still my responsibility to deliver on what it is that my job requires me to do. And I can't go back to my boss and say, well, uh, my employee didn't do it right or my people didn't do it right. But John did absolutely nothing of the sort. He was able to go ahead and use great influence strategies to make things happen. And this is the clever thing that he did. He came up with a risk scoring metric. So take a look at the vulnerabilities that are out there, base them upon criticality of the components, and then assign some points to it. Hey, the stuff that's more critical is worth more points. Therefore, you get a roll up and you get a score. More importantly, that score was considered to be fair because if there was something a system administrator couldn't do anything about, they weren't penalized for that. In addition, they were given a six-month ramp-up time. Hey, here's your score, but we're not telling anybody about that. But at the end of six months, we're telling everybody, all the way up to Secretary Clinton, how well you're doing. Well, guess what? Everybody wants to make sure that they're doing a good job when you get monitored and when you get exposed to everybody else. So by having this uh, rating scale that went from an A down to an F, the organization said, hey, I want to get a little bit better, and who doesn't? And over time, what they're able to do is he said, hey, now that we've got this application that monitors and reports on risk, now we can tighten up the grading scale a little bit. What used to be good enough for an A, well, maybe only get you B plus. So you got to do a little bit more. 
the idea is you don't want people to necessarily say, hey, I'm there, I'm good enough. We want to continue to push things forward and make things happen. And so that's the great thing about this whole concept is that it allowed management to target the emphasis on what needed to be done. Now, back in uh, March of 2010, there's an out-of-cycle Microsoft patch that came out, uh, MS10028. And what that did is that that fixed the problem that was uh, discovered as a result of the big horror attack at Google. This is a zero day. That was one that was exploiting an uh, unknown vulnerability, at least unknown to the vendors. Uh, and that patch had to roll up pretty quickly. So by taking the score and moving it from 40 to 60 to 80, all the way up to 320 points, all of a sudden you're A1 day. A and you're a B minus and then a C and a D and you, you hop out of it very, very quickly. Well, what that did is that created some amazing level of compliance. Within a single week, it got up to 90% patch compliance. And it was months later before other federal agencies were even up at the 20 to 65% level. So this works. And by creating a cultural change, he achieves success. It provides a prioritized strategy, utilizes automation, results are data driven. Okay, this is not just somebody's opinion, and these are things that you can go ahead and they're going to be uh, very objective. So that's a great opportunity. And um, remember that organization that I talked about, that uh, Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity, all that $769 million, guess who's now in charge of that? St. John Stryker, he got promoted to that job. So it's pretty good for your career. Uh, it's not just for federal systems, too. We find out it works well in commercial environments. At the San SCADA Security Summit, one of the CSOs in a large power company came up and said, hey, I implemented these controls. They produced such a dynamic result that my senior management understood it. For the first time they get it, they can see what these automated tools and the roll-ups look like. And he got his security budget approved across the board. That's a baseline now. He doesn't have to fight for his budget from the level zero. He might have to fight for some extras, but they understand. Now, your mileage may vary, and you can't necessarily change federal um, budgeting requirements just because you achieve success, but it really gives you an opportunity to do better. But what if you don't have a lot of money? What if maybe you have no money? Because not everybody gets their full security budget approved, whether you're a corporation or whether you're a federal agency. And so Russell Eubanks wrote a great paper, which you can download, it's in the footnotes here on the SAM site, on a small business, no budget implementation of the SAMS 20 security controls. Why well, everybody likes to see how well can you do things cheaply, better, more efficiently. What he recommended is in addition to doing these things, use the vendor tool sets that come from the operating system vendors. Microsoft has tools like Baseline Security Analyzer. You can buy that. That's free. There's also tools or trial versions you can download from vendors. It may not be full capability. It may be for a limited time. I'm not saying violate license agreements. I'm not saying cheat. Don't steal. But you want to make sure that you've got these capabilities because what that's going to lie to you then is look for uh, various capabilities that you might not be able to do manually. Now, also note that um, NIST provides a list of the uh, security control automation protocol or SCAP validated tools. You go down to the NIST, the uh, comments are going to be there and the resources and also on the white paper. Make sure that if you select a tool that it's validated so you're not going ahead and introducing unproven tool sets in the federal environment that actually might be worse than the problem you're trying to solve. So all we see is that for the solution, automation is key. There's too many moving parts to manage this thing manually. Uh, if you get overwhelmed, you just stare at the problem. It's just all consuming, and then that's the worst thing you can do. You've got to break this thing down into measurable pieces to make things happen. Uh, by using automated collection and reporting help, that's great. And this allows us to then focus on the results and fixing them. And even better, to create an automated response. Because if you have automated diagnosis, you can do automated response. You can have systems disconnect insecure systems, send an alert, take an action automatically without having to have a person in the loop. And that's really huge. And when you do that, you can regain control of your network and achieve the objectives. Well, these 20 critical controls, in addition to representing for FISMA, they will map to the NIST Special Publication 800 TAC 53, which is the security and privacy controls for federal information systems and organizations. Now, there is just a public comment period that had opened up in February, and it just closed last week. And so what we find out is that they're getting ready to go ahead and take a look at some of the new issues that have erupted over the last couple of years. Uh, in the security world, uh, things change so rapidly that after 18 months, I say half of what you know about security is obsolete. It's kind of Gene Mark's rule of security. And we find out that if you roll the clock back, 18 months, 36 months. We had a whole new generation of technology. 
Well, SP 800.53 expects to probably have a new publication date around July, and it's going to address things like the insider threat, cloud computing, advanced persistent threat, and the like. And so that then is going to pretend probably feed back into the 20 critical security controls, and we're going to see that these are going to be updated as well. So these will evolve and change with the threat. So what do we do? We've got the 20 critical security controls. They're an empowering tool for federal system security managers to continue to use success. They help you prioritize security measures, automate the collection, automate the reporting, automate some of the responses, and give you huge leverage if you have a smaller staff. And most importantly, from a compliance perspective, it supports the PISMA reporting requirements. So this is a tool that's going to help you comply with the law and meet the needs that you have that are already mandated by Congress. So security is all about reducing risk to acceptable levels. You can't take security to zero, but you can take it to a reasonable level. We want to develop a strategy and then follow it and recognize that those strategies are going to be very, very important. Uh, to go ahead and implement. Mass the art of influence. You can't necessarily depend upon your positional authority. Find ways to create competitions, create interests, create some measurement that makes everybody want to hop on the bandwagon. And always maintain your guard. And if you do that effectively, you can take this document and use it as an invaluable tool. So thank you very much for that. I've got a couple of references here. Again, these are things you can download. What I'd like to do at this point in time is uh, turn the program over here to Michael Thielander from Tripwire. And uh, Michael, go ahead. Thanks very much, G. Mark. Actually, that was a very, very informative discussion. And for us at Tripwire, it's it's very meaningful because we use the SANS controls um, in a lot of different capacities to look at how do we map what we do, the work that we do in the world in terms of in, um, security automation and compliance automation. How do we map that to benefits that other people can see? A, a little bit of background. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about who Tripwire is. I think most people know our role in information security. Uh, the trip, Tripwire as we know it today as the company was founded back in 97. We've been doing sort of an open source version of Tripwire uh, since the mid-80s, about 300 employees worldwide. A large number of customers rely on Tripwire. We'll talk a little bit about in what capacity they rely on us. What do we do for them? Obviously, a number of award-winning patents, mostly around intrusion detection, uh, and two things that I'm personally proud of: uh, two years in, uh, two years running, uh, received recognition from SC Magazine. Not the editors themselves, but really the readers, in terms of what is the, you know, really the uh, award for excellence for best enterprise security solution and best policy management solution. We're going to talk about both of those, but particularly about our role around policy management. Um, again, real briefly. You know, I don't want this to be a sales pitch at all. I want to talk about what controls, what tools we can provide. If you go down the path of using the SANS Top 20 controls um, to achieve security standards in your organization, what tools can you use to accomplish that? What tools can Tripwire provide for you? Uh, we build our tools around something we call Tripwire V, an integrated controls platform. And some of this language will really resonate from what GMARC was saying. Tripwire V stands for Visibility, Intelligence, and Automation. That's what we provide through the platform that delivers these controls out. An example of visibility is if we start looking at configuration controls, can we see them everywhere? And can we see them at a very, very granular level? Can we see them in network devices, databases, directory servers, and applications? Uh, an example of intelligence, content that tells you, you know, differentiates between what's good and what's bad necessarily in automation. How can we get the reporting information? G. Mark was talking about what eventually leads to the CyberScope initiative for automated roll-up reporting across federal organizations, and we've spent a lot of time looking at how we take our controls and make them work in that context. So VIA basically provides content, you know, uh, common content across our different controls, context. And context is uh, a very simple word with a really important meaning. One of the things that came out of GMARC's discussion was around risk. Which assets have the greatest risk? Which ones should we be looking at most closely? Which ones have... Um, the, uh, the most sensitive information on them. That's context. That's what we provide and share across the controls through the VIA platform. Workflow, obviously allowing these controls to work together, and analytics comes down to how we process the information that we see. Once you get sort of step out from the central VIA platform, we have two key uh, solution suites, product suites that we deliver. Tripwire Enterprise on the right-hand side, which is chiefly responsible for policy management, file integrity management, remediation. And on the left-hand side of this circle, Tripwire Launch.
Log Center, which does log collection management and archiving, as well as our SIM solution. But I really want to start relating these to the SANS controls. So I, I um, as a practitioner and as a professional in the field, really, really like aligning what we do to the SANS controls because, for one reason, it makes sense. Uh, SANS, in a way, will obfuscate all of the things that vendors like Tripwire like to say about you know, whether we call it configuration auditing or secure configuration management or configuration assessment by any other name. We're talking about two key areas and where Tripwire Enterprise, on the Tripwire Enterprise side of the uh, circle, um, has the greatest impact is in SANS critical control number three. SANS critical control number 10. Both of these are concerned with secure configurations, one for in number three for endpoints, uh, desktop servers, laptops, and in number 10 for network devices. Uh, as you know from GMARC's presentation, control number three is, is in the hot end of the list. The first thing, that you, first thing you need to do is obviously the discovery uh, controls, which are in one and two, but then know how those are set. Know the controls that allow you to tell what systems should talk to what system, what ports should be open, uh, what's the minimum configurations for things like password services, operations. And then uh, Control 10 does that for network devices throughout the enterprise. One thing that's really, really critical to that is if you dig in a little bit to how SANS actually defines that these controls should be tested, how should they be value validated. They do a very good job in the description of saying, say the evaluation team must make a change to a file or a configuration or device item and verify that a system generates an alert within 24 hours. As you may or may not know, a lot of our reputation is built on change detection, change auditing, and file integrity management. We're very, very good at noticing when things are not as they should be or when a change has occurred to a critical configuration item or to a file. Um, the fact that we have tightly integrated both what the configuration should be and can detect immediately when it changes makes us especially strong in number three and number ten. Uh, this notice, uh, notice that uh, verification and alerting should be done within 24 hours is interesting, even more interesting, especially for network devices, is the note on the bottom where they say in the future, unauthorized device configuration changes should alert within two minutes. So when somebody comes in, when an exploitation occurs and somebody comes in and makes a change to an ACL or a permission file, that's the kind of thing that should be notified immediately and we get into real-time capabilities. And I, I won't go into that a lot. Uh, but it's an indication of where the trend is going with these controls, automating them and getting as much information as rapidly as possible. Tripwire Enterprise also helps. We, as I said, we chiefly accomplish, fully accomplish really SANS number three and ten. We help a great deal assisting other primary controls for SANS control six around application software security. An example might be Internet ex uh, Information uh, Server, IIS from Microsoft, what can it talk to and when can it talk to other systems and other services, that's the kind of thing that we can assess through our configuration monitoring, wireless device control, and then a uh, controlled use of both administrative privileges and need to know uh, when somebody comes in and elevates their permissions. Those are the controls that we provide in Tripwire Enterprise that, and how they basically map to what SANS is talking about in their critical control structure. The other side of that equation with our Tripwire Log Center product Notice that SANS uh, top 20, number 14, maintain, monitor, and assess security audit logs on an ongoing basis. This is done through Tripwire Log Center product, and I can't stress enough how important it is to combine this information with the information that was on the other side of the circle. And what I mean by that is, if you can imagine monitoring for log events around a critical server, and you see a, a bunch of spurious events, uh, a spike in events that, that looks like um, uh, threatening, threatening activity, anyways, around a particular node or a particular asset. Okay, well, that gives you one facet of the information. Uh, but if you can also look through the policy management side of it, really using SANS controls 3 or SANS controls 10, if you can also look at that and say, well, I've got critical information on those servers. Um, it's not just that I've got, uh, I've also got failing tests on those servers. I have a reduced or weakened security posture on those servers. By combining that information, you know what to work on first and what's really important and what to work on next. And that's really done, again, through the VIA platform. That's where we can apply criticality uh, and notions of risk and priority to an asset. 
Tripwire Lock Center also accomplishes uh, or assists, I should say, it's not, the, I think, the primary control of choice, but can audit the primary controls and also assist with control 12 for admin privileges, control uh, number 15 for controlled access on a need-to-know basis. And one that's really, really critical is account monitoring and control, knowing who can do what in systems and what does it look like in terms of uh, elevated administrative privileges in an environment. That's one of the things that uh, a, an ingress route that's uh, frequently exploited by hackers and people trying to gain information out of um, out of information systems. And I think before I hand this over, um, I want to talk about system state intelligence. So really, the core of what we do um, is really knowing what we call system state intelligence for any given system. You know, the ability to know what is it now? So baseline information, what are the current policy scores? How are we tagging and identifying that asset? And to do it in real time, if possible, what it was. So in other words, we see what it is now. We see the state of that system. And that can be an individual PC or a network segment or an entire organization. Um, what was it before that? How did it change? And when did it change? In other words, I see a change in a permission is that necessary because of deployment of software or or when did that occur and was it who did it actually who provided that change and then also be able to look at that side by side and then additionally along with what it is now and what it was a really good strong sense of what it should be and what it should be comes from you know really with SANS controls 3 and 10 um, comparing that information to some standard CIS benchmarks you know for that tell you what settings should be for both servers as well as network devices and other devices in your environment. Or um, it could be a COVID framework for monitoring SOC systems. It could be JSOCs. It could be, there's a whole, I think Tripwire Enterprise actually supports some 26 different policy sources across um, a vast number of different platforms. But using that information to define what it should be, what is our acceptable standard for what a configuration state should look like. And then I think really the last key element being able to do that continuously. In the federal space, obviously, continuous monitoring uh, is, is more than just a marketing cry. It's a, it's a, it's a march. It's a, uh, a mission statement that says we can never really take our eyes off that. If we go back to the Sun Tzu example, uh, the GMARC started with um, understanding what precautions have been taken by yourself and then what precautions have not been taken and being able to look at that continuously to get a continuous reference of it. That's Tripwire's role in how we look at the SANS Top 20. I think I'm going to hand it over here, and we're going to transition to the next presenter. Don, can you hear us in there? Hi, Don. Sorry, I hear you now. Thank you, Ben. Great. Thank you very, very much, Michael. Appreciate that. Well, uh, we certainly at, uh, at Patriot believe that the Critical 20 uh, controls are extremely well thought, thought out. Uh, it's a, a, an excellent metric-based approach for addressing and managing control weaknesses. And uh, we're encouraged that these uh, control structures are going to move organizations to translate uh, their role from mere control compliance into uh, you know, risk management and risk posture. Uh, and, and of course, that results in uh, much better uh, situational awareness. Um, the, these 20 controls um, also are moving us away from control check, checkbox mindsets and, uh, and really moving us towards real-time risk assessed security so, uh, so that eventually managers will be able to fully assess risk based on environmental and business uh, specific scoring. And, and has, but how, as we look at the, the 20 critical controls and how uh, organizations in both the federal and commercial sectors um, try to adopt these controls. Um, we also see how the policies, procedures, and operational activities still need to be established to cover those functions. And so I'm going to cover a few of those today. Um, I've selected uh, 10 of the, uh, of the 20. Uh, clearly, the first 15, as G. Marcus pointed out, um, are meant to be fully automated. There is some operational considerations that meet, need to be made to those. Um, 
So before I get started, though, let me just give you a little bit of background on the, uh, the organization. So Patriot uh, Technologies was founded in 1996. Uh, we're headquartered in Frederick, Maryland, 60 employees. We're focused uh, solely on information security and have uh, provided security services and products to thousands of commercial and government organizations worldwide. Um, we have established best of breed technology provider partners, and of course, Tripwire uh, is one of those. Um, our professional services organization uh, is split into uh, three different types of functions. Um, the deployment services where we install, upgrade, and perform health checks on, uh, on the platforms that we, uh, that we sell and resell, such as Tripwire. Our consulting services are assessments and compliance uh, based. Um, we, we do uh, create uh, and help our clients to create continuous monitoring programs and perform a lot of threat modeling and government's risk and compliance reviews. And then as it relates to discovery and classification of sensitive data uh, and security engineering, we can provide customized services as well. And of course, the standard residency and staff augmentation and training. So as we look at the 20 critical security controls, um, where, where do we see uh, areas that, uh, that are re required and support? Well, in the first, uh, the first three critical controls, whether inventory, uh, inventory of software or hardware and secure configurations, um, you know, certainly uh, the processes and tools need to be integrated with other activities around asset change, release, and configuration management. You know, for example, if you use a configuration management database to capture the information, you'd still need to integrate it with the automation tools or ensure that at least you've incorporated the requirements specific, specified in frameworks like the IT infrastructure library and the control uh, objectives for information technology to avoid visibility gaps or redundant processes. Uh, in application software security, there's a need to establish secure system development lifecycle uh, and align that to the assessment and authorization phases um, in, uh, uh, in, in FISMA. And of course, the capital planning and investment control models. Um, it's, and, and build strong and great build security and mindset. So that's you know, lots of organizational mindset as well as uh, process. As it relates to security skills assessments and training to fill the gaps, uh, you know, uh, clearly, um, you know, uh, these, these kinds of data, data recovery, I'm sorry, data recovery capabilities need to take into account procedures, timeliness, completeness, ensuring that systems are backed up or at least a weekly basis or more often for systems storing sensitive information. Um, uh, and we have to make sure that backups are encrypted when they're stored locally as well as, they're move, uh, as, well as when they're moved across the network. When we develop security awareness uh, training for various personnel job descriptions, the training needs to include specific incident-based scenarios so that uh, training needs to reflect proven defenses, uh, latest attack techniques, uh, assessment quizzes. Uh, we need to conduct periodic exercises to verify that employees and contractors are fulfilling their information security roles. As it relates to the controlled use of administrative privileges, um, that's really uh, a little bit of discovery and classification. We need to understand what those privileges are as it relates to sensitive information, the administrative privileges and access controls around that, in, that, uh, that sensitive information. The value of logs, uh, whether it's uh, maintenance monitoring, um, all security logs, uh, it, it really increases exponentially with the de degree of context that needs to be provided. So again, we need to understand what this uh, information means uh, with it to the business. And that goes really for data loss, pre data loss prevention. Without a proper discovery uh, process, without identifying where and what kind of sensitive data we, out, we have out there, uh, any kind of a data loss prevention exercise uh, may not be covering all sensitive data. As it relates to incident response, well, we have to ensure we've got written incident response procedures, a definition of roles uh, for handling incidents. Um, it needs to align for the federal, in the federal space, with, uh, be consistent with NIST guidelines. Obviously, we need to assign job duties and define management personnel that support the incident process. We need to publish information to, to all personnel for employees and contractors regarding uh, computer anomalies and, and incidences to the incident handling team. And then we have to conduct periodic incident scenario sessions with, uh, with impact analyses. 
when we get into secure network engineering, um, obviously we need to support rapid response and, and the shunning of these detected attacks that the con critical controls uh, relate to. The network architecture and the systems need to be engineered for rapid deployment of access control, rules, signatures, blocks, black holes, and other defensive me measures. Uh, it, we can uh, approach DNS uh, and, and obviously to engineer DNS to be deployed in a hierarchical fashion. And then we need to segment the enterprise network into multiple and separate trust zones to provide granular uh, control of system access and, in and internet uh, boundary defenses. And then beyond basic network diagrams, we need to graphically represent business services and the, and the devices associated with each one. Finally, although it's the, the last one, penetration testing and, and red team exercises, these need to be conducted regularly to identify the vulnerabilities and attack vectors that can be used to exploit enterprise systems. And we need to conduct these from not only from inside but outside the perimeter, uh, as well as uh, uh, attacking our wireless infrastructures to simulate these outsider and insider attacks. The red team exercises need to test the readiness of the organization to identify and stop the attacks. And we need to uh, we need to measure how well the organi organization has reduced the enablers for attackers by setting up automated processes to, to identify clear text mails, network diagrams, assessments, and test reports, and so on. And then finally, we need to devise a scoring method for deter determining the results of the, the success of the red team exercises, so that these can, results can be compared over time. Maybe even creating a yeah. test bed that mimics production environment and a red team attacks against elements that aren't typically tested in production, such as uh, control systems, uh, SCADA systems, and, and so on. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of, there is a lot of organizational uh, process and procedure that certainly surrounds these, uh, these 20 critical controls. And I hope uh, you can see uh, what, to, uh, at least 20 area, uh, 10 areas where, uh, where you can concentrate. Well, this is James Troll again. I want to thank everybody so far for the, uh, the, the presentations. We've had some good feedback and some good um, interaction so far. just want to remind everyone, uh, if you do have questions for the speakers, we'll give you one last opportunity to go ahead and post those. We have a couple that have come in. We'll go ahead and start with those. But again, if you have questions specifically for some of the speakers, now is your opportunity to go ahead and put those, as I mentioned, into the chat window uh, you'll see in the Illuminate session. Uh, the questions I'm going to that are coming so far, let's go ahead and ask these uh, of the group. Uh, so those of you that want to go ahead and participate, again, I know there's a number of people on the, um, the webcast today. Uh, feel free to jump in with some thoughts or any feedback you want to give there. Uh, the first one I want to go ahead and give out, uh, many of these will be directed at GMARC, but we'll go ahead and let Michael and then Don also interact here as well. Uh, the first question we have is, how does SANS determine the priority of the controls in the 20 critical controls? Uh, it seems like there was a pretty big jump between version 3 and 3.1 of the critical controls especially regarding the order of the priority there. Uh, where does that prioritization come from? Well, so Mark James, I'd say that, uh, you know, that that's a question that is a, a good one. More to a point is we have an evolving set of threats that are out there, and we look at the response that is uh, required to go ahead and deal with them. And uh, as a result, this has to be a living document. We can't focus ourselves on the problems that existed pre previously uh, new attacks occur, and as a result, that may change the prioritization based upon the, uh, the damage that they cause. Kind of simplistic answer, but I, I, I want to open the mic up to some of the other speakers as well to allow them to fill in some more details. Yeah, this is Michael uh, from Tripwire, and I, I don't actually know the answer to the question, although it is a really good question, but I, I appreciate the fact that, that uh, SAND as an organization continually looks at the threat landscape and they look at how exploits are actually occurring and they make those shifts. The last time this came out, you know, we what we now talk about doing critical control 3 and critical control 10 was, I think, uh, 4 and 5, if I remember right. And as we look at it in retrospect, I think what they're talking about makes sense as they sort of elevate uh, configuration uh, system hardening around servers where the data is and elevate that in terms of priority. And then to some degree they sort of uh, lessen the criticality of doing it around network devices, um, mostly because in recognition of the fact that uh, if you appropriately harden servers and endpoints, you have a little bit less uh, need 
or I should say priority or urgency around always assessing configurations on your network devices. So I like the fact that as a as a standards body, as a as a group of individuals, they take the time to assess what those priorities mean and then reflect it in their own listings. And one other piece of information, this is James Charles again. I'll go ahead and pass on as well. Um, I've had the opportunity to be a part of many of the, the editing groups the, and the committees that have actually been able to um, put out the new versions and edits of the controls. And in the version 3.1 that did come out, for those of you wondering, uh, there w GMARC has already made mention of probably one of the biggest influencers uh, earlier in the presentation, which was the uh, U.S.'s National Security Agency. Um, the NSA has been in, in a lot of communications with um, the, the CFIS, or Center for Strategic International Studies, uh, that sponsors the, the documentation here along with the SANS Institute. And they have a lot of feedback into this process as far as prioritizing based on attacks and threats that, that they've been noticing over the past 12 months or so. The other group that, that's not been mentioned so far that I would definitely recommend everyone check out if you have an opportunity uh, is the work that was done by the Australian Defense Signals Directorate. Uh, the Australian DSD you know, did a fair amount of research into this area as well and compiled uh, the threats that they were facing uh, in the Australian government and as well, especially in the DSD. And they actually came out with two different documents uh, and an updated version of one of those documents. Uh, one of the documents was what was called the Top 35 Mitigation Strategies. And uh, those Top 35 Mitigation Strategies were basically what their response to the threats that they saw occurring were, uh, very similar in nature to how the 20 critical controls work, except in terms of very specific, pointed, uh, short controls they were recommending to their constituents. Uh, they released a version of that in 2010, and in 2011 they did release an updated guide to that as well. Um, as they communicated with uh, the folks at CSS and SANS and, and the committees that are involved in writing um, many of these controls, they were sort of a big um, proponent of doing prioritization. Uh, prior to version 3.1, there really was no prioritization, so this is sort of a new thing. They also developed something called the, what they called their sweet spot, or basically four controls uh, that they said were probably the, the, the most important things for organizations to focus on. Uh, and that was sort of, again, part of the feedback process that they had given. This really has become uh, sort of more of an international uh, collaborative effort here as well, outside of even the U.S. I want to go ahead and move on as well to another question that's come in. Again, we don't have so much time today. Um, a question that's come in here um, from John. It says, uh, could the presenter expand on why the defender should adhere to principles if the attacker does, uh, regarding a slide earlier in the presentation? I'm guessing, Mark, uh, G. Mark, this, this question is sort of for you. Well, yeah, and, and if you recall from back on that slide is that I didn't say that the defenders need to adhere to the same principles as the attacker. I said that the attackers seem to be following principles we should be following as well. And the whole idea being is that if you're up against an organized opponent, it kind of behooves you to organize yourselves to make sure that we can go ahead and provide a coordinated response. And so as I brought up a little article on Sun Tzu and a little quote there saying this seems to reflect a lot of the attack methodologies that we see out there, attack where your opponent's not looking, hit them hard, go basically go after the zero days, after unpatched systems. I'm saying that our philosophy, our response, is using the SANS 20 critical security controls as our baseline that we use to go ahead and defend. So I'm not at all suggesting that we try to go ahead and say the best defense is a good offense. Uh, rather, I'm saying is that uh, the SANS 20 critical controls gives us the best defense. This is Don Fergus, of course, having said that, uh, you know, for, for red teams, uh, you know, the, the stance that they are ta that, that many red teams need to take is that of the, uh, the, malicious, um, the, the malicious attacker. Uh, and so uh, to the extent that many of the techniques that, um, that uh, the, the black hat uh, may, uh, uh, may employ, um, those uh, particular techniques need to be tested uh, equally by the, uh, by the red team. Well, excellent. We appreciate everyone's feedback on that. I'm going to come to another question here as well that's come in um, regarding these critical controls as well as um, the ISO standards. Uh, a lot of organizations have been implementing uh, the ISO 27000 family, uh, specifically 27001 and 2, and, and some of the newer guides that are coming out in that series. Uh, how do these 20 critical controls map, or do they map, or relate back to uh, the controls that are listed in the 27000 uh, family uh, of standards? This is Michael. Let me jump in on that 
just from Tripwire's experience, we do an awful lot of business in different parts of the world. So we have a lot of business in EMEA that's really related to the ISO 27001 family, a lot of business in APAC and Southeast Asia related to different standards like the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is ultimately based on both CIS and SANS type controls. Um, and I don't know that there's a specific mapping from SANS to ISO 27001 or that family. But what I do know is that there are really good mappings between NIST controls and SANS controls. If you just Google NIST SANS mapping, for instance, you can get a pretty good mapping. Uh, and actually, I should say, even in the SANS website, under the description of each control, they'll show you which NIST controls it most closely relates to, whether it's in configuration management or access. Um, and then you can easily look up a mapping between NIST and ISO 27000. There's several of those that are available too that show it in uh, sort of different lenses based on taxonomy of a type of test or based on the, uh, a given control area. So while the short answer is I don't know if there's a direct map from SANS to ISO 27001, there's at least a one step route between there. You just go ahead and access, you know, go to the SANS site, look at which um, which NIST controls they're referencing for each one of the top 20, and then you know go to any number of different sources and look at the NIST to ISO mappings. And I can then go ahead and provide some feedback there from Sam's point of view as well. Um, there was in the 3.0 and 3.1 versions, there was an official mapping that was compiled. Uh, unfortunately, due to some editing constraints and time constraints regarding the, the release date of the documentation for the latest version, uh, we weren't able to get that to our copy editor in time in order to get that included. Um, but our understanding is in the next version, uh, that, doc that mapping has been completed. Uh, so that's something that we have ready to go. It's just a matter of actually integrating that into the next version. Um, as GMark had indicated earlier, there are some pretty big updates coming out in the federal space, especially looking at 853's next revision uh, and some of that feedback. And as you, as you said, you have to imagine that there'll be a fairly large update that comes out to all of the corresponding documentation later this year. And we do hope that in the next release we'll be able to integrate uh, that ISO mapping that, that we've been able to come up with into the version, again, just to make it easier for everybody who's doing that ISO um, implementation, especially internationally. All right, we have time for I think maybe one more question. I'm going to throw this out to the group for everyone who has a chance to answer. Uh, how does the automation of these 20 critical controls fit into the, the concept of continuous monitoring that we're hearing so much about here recently? That's you know that's a really really good question, and it's almost to me it's from Tripwire's perspective that is the million dollar question. And the way that we always look at it is that when you have the ability between a, an essentially preventive control, and I would say that uh, controls three and ten for securing configurations on on servers and network devices are essentially preventive controls, and if you have them in uh, working in such a way that they can actually talk to, for lack of a better phrase, to your detective controls. If you look at the SIM controls, for instance, in that family, in that group, if I can look at the fact that a configuration item has has failed or lessened or the overall score on a system has gone down at some point in time, um, and if I can also correlate that information to SIM and events that are going on around that and then automatically generate a report on it, we're able to provide that level of automation. And if we can take our periodic reporting, as I said, most of these controls, top 15 or so, should really be on an automated basis. If we can have the systems in place that have uh, triggers, basically. Another really good example is when you've got um, logging in most situations on a system, say on a host or server, should never be turned off. Sometimes it is turned off. If you can have a way between, of course, the SIM and log controls for them to be checked and the configuration items in, say, uh, critical control three say, oh, we detect a change, the change was to logging, and now we can automatically re-enable logging, then you're starting to develop automation. And then the last step of that, of course, is automate the report of that. Be able to roll that up and say, this is what we detected, this is what the system took did with the action that it took, and this is the result of it. Um, automation pulls all of those different pieces together with a series of embedded triggers, or sometimes we call them conditional actions, that make these things work together seamlessly and ultimately lead to the fact that we can roll these up in reports and dashboards in an automated way. I don't know if that answers the question, but it's, uh, it's sort of a tripwire-centric view of 
uh, the automation that we provide to continuous monitoring frameworks. Well, I want to thank you for that feedback, Michael. Uh, unfortunately, I have to probably cut things short, and we have uh, reached our full time here. I uh, want to thank everybody for being on the webcast today. Hopefully, you've gotten a, a better perspective of the critical controls, especially in the U.S. federal space and how the two of those relate. Obviously, there's going to be a lot more talk, as I would imagine, in the upcoming months about how these two systems will be working more and more together. Uh, those of you who have attended the webcast today will have the option of receiving a copy of a white paper uh, that's actually been written around this topic as well to sort of form the foundation of the content you saw presented today, um, which will be published here within the next one to two months. Uh, we look forward to getting that in your hands to be able to review that as well. And for those of you interested in this topic and other similar uh, white papers, uh, please do encourage you to check out the SANS Analyst um, program and the white papers that have been published today, uh, which again is another free resource made available to you by the SANS Institute. Again, we want to thank you for your opportunity to be here today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, at a webcast in the near future. Have a great afternoon.